Hi, this is John Littaball, and this is AP US History Video 12, Geography and Regional Development in British North America, Contact Disease and Demographic Change for Native Americans, Imperial Conflict, and North American Political Instability. Please, 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 if you like this video, do subscribe, like, and share this video. That'll really help me out a lot. And here's johnlinaballtutoring.com is my website if you want to look at that. So the post-contact collapse of the Huron from disease and war. In the early 1600s, the French explorer Samuel de Champlain encountered the Huron people who lived in what is now Ontario, Canada. The Huron and French formed an alliance in 1609. By the 1630s, contact with French settlers, including Jesuit priests, was disastrous for the Huron because the French transmitted measles and smallpox to the Huron. While the pre-contact Huron population is believed to have been 20,000 to 40,000 disease killed between one half and two thirds of the population, reducing it to possibly as low as in the 6,000s. The collapse of the Huron continued. The Beaver Wars, discussed later, further reduced the Huron population. In 1649, an Iroquois raiding party of roughly a thousand warriors, armed with guns by their Dutch allies, destroyed Huron mission villages in Ontario, killing roughly 300 people, including some Jesuit priests. The Huron fled to an island in Georgian Bay, Ontario, where many of them died from harsh conditions and starvation. Many Hurons settled in Quebec and the Upper Lake Michigan region. This new form of warfare completely disrupted traditional Native American forms of dispute resolution, which had the effect of destroying or relocating many tribal communities. Post-contact cultural adaptation by the Catawba. Most, if not all, Native American groups were faced with an unappealing choice, either work for the settlers, move in land away from the settlers, fight the settlement or the settlers, and or join other Native American groups. None of those were particularly appealing to most Native American tribes. The Catawba people of the American Southeast attempted to survive by making themselves useful to the settlers, selling goods such as baskets, moccasins, or pottery to the settlers of South Carolina as traveling peddlers. This worked. Relations between the Catawba and settlers were friendly, but sustained contact with the settlers changed the Catawba culture. Pottery and basket redesigns changed to meet demand kind of makes sense because the English, British, whatever settlers of South Carolina and North Carolina, anybody who the Catawba ran into would probably have different tastes in basketry and pottery than Native Americans. So of course they would have to change their design to, set, to make them more saleable, so to speak. By the 1750s, the use of alcohol as payment to the settlers for goods caused huge alcohol-related problems, that is, fights, other drunken behavior in the Catawba Nation. And, of course, all of this contact between the Native Americans and the British settlers did change the Catawba culture because it just happens. You hang around people who are different from you, you're probably going to pick up some things from them, and they'll pick up some things from you. Imperial Conflicts and North American Political Instability In the 17th and 18th centuries, the political situation in North America became unstable. Rivalries between the British, French, Dutch, and Spanish traveled to the New World from the Old World with the settlers and explorers from those countries. And, as stated previously, the introduction of firearms to Native American conflicts deeply altered conflicts between Native American groups and thus the political military landscape of North America. Leave it to Beaver. The Beaver Wars, that is. The Beaver Wars, 1640 to 1701. Old Native American rivalries intensified as a result of European colonization. Several European powers allied with Native American groups and introduced firearms to the Native groups, often as a result of the fur trade. The Beaver Wars were particularly nasty events in the middle and late 1600s that illustrated the results of firearms being added to Native conflicts. As the name suggests, the Beaver Wars stemmed from the fur trade. The French and Dutch established trading posts where goods, including guns, were exchanged for furs. Obviously, that led to problems because European powers and their Native American allies 
wanted to extend their control over the fur trade, so we end up with a lot of wars over beaver pelts. And here's a beaver going off to war. Ha ha ha. I just thought that was funny, so I put that there. The Beaver Wars continued. French traders established a series of trading posts along the St. Lawrence River starting in the early 1600s. The French allied themselves with Algonquian-speaking tribes who lived near the Great Lakes. Meanwhile, the Dutch established trading posts at what is now Albany, New York in 1614 and allied themselves with the Iroquois Confederacy. The Iroquois hoped to expand their trading network but were blocked by the Huron. By 1645, the tensions between the Iroquois and the Algonquian tribes broke out into open warfare. More about the Beaver Wars. The British took over New Netherland from the Dutch in 1664, and the British continued the Dutch's alliance with the Iroquois, fighting the French and French's Native American allies. The Beaver Wars ended in 1701 with the Great Peace of Montreal. The Iroquois expanded their power and territory as a result of the Beaver Wars. So we can see by looking at this map, this pink section is the original Iroquois homeland. So basically most of upstate New York. So during the Beaver Wars, you can see in various years, the Iroquois managed to massively expand their territory to all these areas that are painted orange. So we can see what is now Southern Ontario, Michigan, what is now most of Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, da, 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 Pennsylvania, West Virginia, Virginia, and so on. So, da, da, da. As we just discussed, the Huron were virtually destroyed. As such, the Iroquois learned that they held the balance of power between the British and French, so they could play one power off against another. The wars, the fur trade, and the equipping of Native American tribes with guns realigned Native American alliances and societies. The French and Indian Wars were a battle for control of North America from 1688 to 1763. Four main conflicts between 1688 and 1763, collectively known as the French and Indian Wars. First was King William's War from 1688 to 1697. The second was Queen Anne's War from 1702 to 1713. The third was King George's War from 1744 to 1748. And the fourth was the French and Indian War, which is a confusing name because it wasn't a war between the French and Native Americans. It was a war basically by the British and their allied Native American tribes against the French and the French's Native American allies. This one finally kicked the French and military and government out of North America. The French and Indian Wars continued. All four French and Indian Wars followed similar patterns. The first three arose from conflicts between the French and British in Europe, and the fourth started in North America and became a worldwide Franco-British conflict, that is a conflict between the French and the British. Second similarity all involved an intensified rivalries between the Native American tribes involved. The third similarity, the tribes allied themselves with the French and the British, and the tribes controlled their own territory as long as neither side won a conflict-ending victory. Finally, all four wars made British colonists more loyal to the British, since wars and uncertain borders made them need the British military for protection. This changed after the French were defeated in 1763. King William's War, 1688-1697. The Nine Years' War in Europe spread to North America between several European powers, including Britain and France. So this was fought in Europe and then spread to North America. Conflicts between the British, French, and allied Native American tribes led to this war. The Iroquois dominated the fur trade in New York and the Great Lakes regions from 1680. So we can see New York kind of around here. The Great Lakes would be over here, but we can't see it on that map. And so they were dominated by the Iroquois and the British since the 1680s as a result of the Beaver Wars. However, French colonists and Indian allies further west challenged that. Also similar conflicts occurred in New York and Canada. English settlements in Maine encroached on the French colony of Acacia, which included present-day New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, and Maine north of the Kennebec River. So we're talking about kind of over in this area here. And fun fact is Acacia, you may have heard of Cajuns in Louisiana. That's because people moved from Acacia to 
the Louisiana Territory and became known as Cajuns by people down there. So the French and native allies fought against British encroachment. The French and their native allies formed the Wabanaki Conspiracy for that purpose after King Philip's War. After King William's War, the Iroquois Confederacy notif not notified, negotiated the Grand Settlement of 1701 with France and other nations. For the next 50 years, the Iroquois were mostly neutral in conflicts over North American territory. At Queen Anne's War, 1702 to 1713. This happened in Canada and the American South. The French and the British fought in Canada as they had in King William's War. The British gained Newfoundland and Hudson Bay, but the border between British Maine and French Acacia was still disputed. So there were definitely problems up around here and through here. So. The Wabanaki Confederacy again tried to stop British colonists. The Wabanaki, with French support, raided the Massachusetts town of Deerfield, which is right here, and destroyed that town and killed 56 colonists it took, and also took 112 prisoners to Quebec. So that would be up here. The raid was popular in the media of the time, an account by the Reverend John Williams of his capture and return to Massachusetts was a bestseller. His daughter, Eunice, married a Kanawake Indian and stayed in Quebec, which led to soul-searching among Puritans, including the family of Eunice Williams and John Williams. Queen Anne's War Continued. The South, the European powers, and native allies fought. So in the late 1600s, the French traveled down the Mississippi River to reinforce French claims to the Mississippi River Basin made by Robert de la Salle in 1670. So we can see the blue is French territory. So here's the Mississippi River Basin. And we can see here's a cage. So remember how I was talking about the Cajuns? So obviously they came down through here and went down the Mississippi and in through here. So, British traders and slave raiders went west from Carolina, okay? We can see here's Carolina, and here's the present-day state of North Carolina, South Carolina. So they went this way. And so the Chickasaw tribe assisted in getting slaves for British slavers. The Choctaw, who were traditional enemies of the Chickasaw, allied with the French who built forts at what are now the cities of Biloxi, Mississippi and Mobile, Alabama. So the British and Spanish fought over boundary between Carolina, so remember this is Carolina, and Florida, this is Florida, south of the Savannah River and what is now Georgia. So the French, Spanish, and the Appalachian tribe formed an alliance against the British to keep the British out of Florida, etc., and out of these French territories. Even more Queen Anne's War. War didn't solve the boundary issues between the British and Spain over the Cal not Cal over the Carolina and Florida border. So here's the Carolinas, here's Georgia, okay, and then here's a disputed zone between what is now Georgia and what is now Florida. So this was Spanish Florida. Span you know, the Spanish said, hey, Florida goes all the way up to here. And the British said, uh, 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 no, it goes down to about here. So that was still disputed. The war did not settle that dispute. Appalachia and Temecula were practically exterminated by the British in 1704 um, because those tribes were practically devastated by the war. So anyway, the war did devastate the Spanish and allied tribes in Florida. And as I said, the Appalachia and Temecula were practically exterminated by the British in 1704. The British allies, the Chickasaw, managed to stave off attacks by the Choctaw and Illinois tribes, although the Choctaw and Illinois were assisted by the French. Since the Chickasaw took huge losses, again, think Pyrrhic victory, another such victory and we are lost, they became very dependent upon their British allies. The major battles continued into the 1730s, and the most important battles happened in 1736 and 1739. The fighting didn't cease until 1763, which was the end of the French and Indian War, where the French were defeated. 
King George's War. This was fought between 1744 and 1748. This is the third conflict between the French and the British and was fought in New York, Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Nova Scotia. So the, there was a successful siege by British troops of the French fortress at Louisbourg on Nova Scotia or Louisbourg. I'm not sure, probably Louisbourg. Anyway, this is a picture of the fort. The French and Native Americans, in return, destroyed Saratoga, New York, and you know, things like that happened during the war. The war settled nothing. The treaty at the end had British return Louisbourg to the French. The French returned the city of Madras, India, to the British. Remember, this was a war being fought worldwide between two global spanning empires, the French and the British Empire. The treaty was unpopular with northern colonists who'd suffered heavy losses to disease and starvation in holding Louisbourg during the winter after they captured the fortress. Again, you can think Pyrrhic victory, like, yay, we took over this fort. Oh, we're freezing and starving. So it's not such a good thing. The French and Indian War, 1754 to 1763, also known as the Seven Years' War. And yes, it did last nine years, actually, not seven years. So in case you're doing the math saying, wait a minute, 63 minus 54, that's nine, not seven. What's going on here, John? Anyway, it was arguably the first, in quotes, world war because it was fought worldwide between the French and English in their colonies all around the world. The part fought in North America was called the French and Indian War, which again is confusing because the British and native allies fought the French and their native allies. Most of the tribes actually sided with the French. It wasn't a war between French and Indians slash natives. This one finally kicked the French military and government out of North America. Perhaps it should be called the confusingly named war. The French surrendered in 1763 and ceded their colonies, etc., to the British. This led to adverse consequences for the Native Americans, which we will discuss in future videos. Did you find this video useful? Please like it and subscribe to my channel. Neither action costs you anything. You'll be alerted about my new videos. Why do I care? It's simple. YouTube doesn't let me share in any ad revenue unless I have 1,000 subscribers and 4,000 hours. That is 240,000 minutes of view time in a year. And YouTube recently let us know about their changes to their policy. So now it's official. Even if I'm not monetized, that is my videos aren't monetized and I'm not making any money from it, they have the right to put ads on it. So if you're seeing ads, just know that I'm not getting any money for these. At least I'm not getting any money until I have a thousand subscribers and 4,000 hours of watch time in a year. So I don't have a thousand subscribers at this time getting closer, don't have it. And I definitely don't have 4,000 hours of watch time. Would you like to see this without ads? Speaking of ads, you could join my community at testpreparation.locals.com. It costs a very small amount of money to join, but you get to see all this content without any advertising. Wouldn't you like that? For the same reasons, you're not only welcome, but encouraged to share links to this video, put it in playlists, etc. I'm always happy to read and respond to constructive criticism or suggestions for new videos. I'd appreciate your input. I reserve the right to delete comments from and block those who specialize in destructive criticism, you know, trolls or things that are off topic, you know, spammers and disturbed people. You can also hire me for tutoring. My contact information follows on the next slide. And thanks for watching. Facebook, you can just go to facebook.com forward slash Linneval Tutoring, all one word. Instagram.com forward dot slash John dot Linneval dot Tutoring. Phone number 415-623-4251. You can also email me. Well, you can email me at john at johnlinneball.com. You can also text me on the phone number I've listed here, 415-623-4251. Website is johnlinneball.com or johnlinneballtutoring.com. And you can also reach me at testpreparation.locals.com. And my mailing address is John Lenneval Tutoring, 1859 Powell Street, number 109, San Francisco, California, 94133. And...
you should know this is not a substitute for your classes, text, etc. This video is based on the Barron's AP History review book, AP US History review book, I should say, and it's also based on the Princeton Reviews, you know, cracking the AP US History exam premium 2019, and other sources that'll be listed in the video description. And while this should help you do well on the AP US History exam, I can't be responsible for what your teacher thinks is important and asks you about in his or her own tests, homework, etc. Please read your class text and pay attention to what your teacher says in class. All right, have a good day.